in the last 10 years, they've dropped by half. So there's no way they're in plague proportions, suggesting they're in plague proportions. In many cases, it's because they have been um, forced out of other areas and forced into smaller areas. And so it looks like there are many. But I, used to, I like to use the analogy that if you, if you go to uh, a busy railway station or a shopping plaza you know, at peak time, there are a lot of humans there. But then if you go there when it's not peak time or when it's closed, there's no one. The same thing with the kangaroo. There are a number of reasons that it's important to protect this animal. Firstly, it's an indelible part of this landscape and has been for a long time and has been adopted by many aspects of Australian culture as an iconic animal. Uh, secondly, it's, it's important for a tourism point of view. It's a unique creature to this land and lots of people are interested in it. And thirdly, I think that it, because it's an iconic animal, we should be holding ourselves up as a demonstration that here is an animal, despite the fact that this country is now 22 million people and growing quickly, it's an animal that can still reside in this country and not go the same way as lots of other animals and become extinct. Whenever you think of Australia, you immediately think kangaroos, and there's no question about that. And they're the second most recognized symbol in the whole world, second only to the Statue of Liberty. They developed in this country, they are this country's animal and it makes sense to utilise something that we've got here um, and just maintain, have the, well the government departments which they are doing now, maintain the numbers carefully, um, conservatively and conservationally. And I think this plague notion is also a rather a spin that um, the industry and the farming lobby uh, promote in order to continue this image of this idea that, that kangaroos are a problem or a pest. Um, but really all, all that they're trying to do is promote agribusiness and also then to promote a business which is about the commercial killing of kangaroos. And often the vision that's taken to show the so-called plague quote unquote proportion of kangaroos is usually during drought and at a water hole or a water source. And it's just common sense that animals that are struggling in a drought period, no matter what species, kangaroos or another, they will con congregate in those areas. So you can do a scan with a camera and have a commentary saying, oh my God, they're taking over the country and all the rest of it. But it's interesting, just recently, in, in trying to promote the, the market to reopen to Russia, is that um, the Russian official who was here from the uh, uh, Department of Agriculture of, of Russia, he was taken to the country and dri driven around quite a lot. And he even made the comment that I was told that, that kangaroos were overrunning this country and I haven't seen one. Personally, I can't see the kangaroo as an animal ever becoming endangered or extinct because they're such a successful breeder. They've lived in one of the most uh, harshest and arid lands there are in the world and they've adapted. Their breeding system goes through a, a system where they can adjust to the, to the rainfall, to the, to the feed supply. They can move great distances to, to, to source food. They, eat a large range of, of plants, uh, which means they're not stuck on just one particular grass, etc. They, they'll eat anything and um, uh, they grow quite quickly. You know, they're, they're a very, very successful animal for, for what they've been utilised for and they'll never ever become endangered despite what anybody says. The kangaroos used to be on the US 
endangered species list. So by 1995, the United States government, under pressure from Australia, removed kangaroos from the U.S. protection. Now, the reason that is a really important thing is because as long as our beautiful kangaroos were on the U.S. threatened species list under their Endangered Species Act, the Australian government had to provide kangaroo management plans and programs that were under scrutiny by those outside Australia. So now, since 1995, not one government agency has had to be responsible to anybody for the killing that took place in Australia of our, our kangaroos. This industry is beset by health questions, serious health questions. If it's not cooked thoroughly, which is what the industry say that that's how it should be, otherwise it's going to be very tough, um, E. coli and salmonella survive the uh, rare cooking, cooking of meat rare or, or uh, rare to medium rare, and that is a very dangerous situation. The level of salmonella or, or bacteria, there is always a certain level. Uh, and nobody can say that it can be totally eliminated, but it's, it's keeping that level under the, the control on the levels that has been set by the Australian standards. And if you go looking for a problem, you look hard enough, you'll find a problem, and you just utilise that. But, but the, the, the volume of kangaroo meat that's, that's consumed in Australia and overseas, I've never heard of anybody getting sick or dying from salmonella or contamination of kangaroo meat. These animals, these kangaroos, they are wild animals and therefore they have a range of um, parasites, worms and so on uh, that, you know, would be ordinarily treated in farm production animals. These are wild animals, they're not treated for those kinds of things. Now we know that because we have lots of wild animals come here uh, that we get and we have to treat these animals ourselves for these kinds of parasites and worms and so on. I just love native animals and I've just developed um in particular, I love of the kangaroos, as I think they're my favourite because they're so gentle and they actually develop a very strong bond with humans. Yes, darling. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. Yes, so the skin was torn from under his chin, so he's had a. Reggie, put your head back, darling. He's had a flap repair of his. Um, his neck done because the skin was um, completely torn back. He was caught in the fence. Every time they shoot a mother, there's a baby left behind. And uh, we get big boys as well. We try to save the big boys because uh, that's another problem with um, uh, the kangaroo killing is they kill the, the biggest and the strongest. And I'm hoping that this afternoon you'll be able to see Captain, our, our local dominant male, who I'm quite good friends with. I give him a few pellets every night. And if they kill our dominant males, um, what, what you get is act, actually mayhem in, a, in the local population because um, you'll, you know, when it's mating season, the, um, you, know, you get every testosterone crazed teenage uh, kangaroo chasing the little girls. And uh, if they kill the dominant male, he's pretty much the policeman. He comes along and tells all the other boys to get lost, um, you know, behave themselves. And 
and uh, keeps um, everything in order and the, the girls are safe. So it's a ter terrible shame, you know, when they um, destroy the uh, social structure of the, uh, the kangaroo mob. And so the gene pool will gradually become weaker and weaker. And uh, at, as um, a GP, I mean, I see the, um, the flu viruses, the avian influenza virus, all it takes um, uh, for one of these viruses to become um, lethal is a, a single mutation. And it's the same with the kangaroos. They're subject to viruses as well. And you can see it with the Tasmanian devil. All it takes is a, a mutation that uh, in perhaps one of the um, pathogens and that could decimate the kangaroo population if we've already weakened their gene pool by shooting the biggest and the strongest. And then they're heading for major trouble. The animals have to be eliminated to keep the numbers in check. The amount of accidents there would be with vehicles, um, uh, there's, there's thousands killed by trucks uh, up and down the highways. Just around here locally, there's people hitting kangaroos all the time, smashing their cars up. It's only a matter of time before somebody is seriously injured or killed um, as a result of a, of, of a collision with a kangaroo. So the numbers have to be checked. So the harvesting uh, is part of the culling process. It's just that the animals are being utilised for human consumption and pet food. One of the main reasons why the kangaroo meat industry is, is good too um, is because um, not that they're being farmed, they're being wild harvested, they'll never be farmed, is that they do not emit methane like, like um, cattle and deer and uh, sheep. Um, they don't have that um, ruminant, rumen or double stomach that those animals have got and um, the digestive system is totally different, so they don't emit um, uh, methane gas. Kangaroo meat would be the biggest turnover or consumed uh, meat in the game meat industry, uh, purely because it's, it's wild harvested and um, uh, the numbers are there to supply. Um, and it's the cost, they're cost effective too, because not having to be farmed, um, even though they have to be harvested by professional shooters and and that costs money, but it's nowhere near as much as farming, say, deer or, or emus or ostriches or, or um, beef and sheep. And um, the advantages of the, of the meat itself is, is very nutritious. It's been utilised by the indigenous people for the last 60,000 years. And um, it'll never become, the animal will never become extinct because it's such a successful breeder and works in with the, the climates to suit. Uh, the indigenous people, the Aboriginal people, are now taking a stand on this. They have, they have issued a warning. They've formed an organisation called the Australian Alliance for Native Animal Survival, which are indigenous people. And a lot of elders came together, about 55, I think, and they formed an organisation. And their view is, is that the government and should not be permitting and giving permits to industry to come in and do this mass slaughter of an animal. It is an insult and an affront to their sense of connection to the animal in, in the same way as their connection to ancient uh, sacred land. So they've warned the government that if they issue a permit to either reopen the industry to, to Russia or to pre commence the industry to China, they're all marching into the federal court to challenge that, which will be a very interesting case indeed. If you were to have an industry policy associated with kangaroos, there is no comparison that tourism, international tourism, far, far outweighs any income that's generated uh, via the um, kangaroo killing industry. More importantly, that the income that is generated through tourism is far spread far wider across the economy than you would in a very uh, uh, one industry privately owned industry, okay? So you get income being generated by the kangaroo killing industry um, and that income is taxed in the normal way and so income goes to the government but it doesn't go very much beyond that. Whereas in the tourism industry you've got all kinds of 
tourism type operators, accommodation establishments, retail establishments that are associated with the tourism industry. So the income that's generated is multiplied many times over than you would in a single industry like kangaroo um, slaughter industry. So uh, not only is the kind of inc the, the amount of income generated substantially greater, but it's multiplied substantially more over and spread far more widely across the economy. Mm -hmm.